The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I we can get started. Anyway, welcome today, uh, Stefan Andreev is our guest speaker from Morgan Stanley. And as I understand it, you have a degree, PhD degree in chemical in, physics? In chemical physics, yes. And, oh, maybe uh, I should go here. And, ah, <laughs> okay. Good. and now he's in the world of finance. Uh, That's right. And we're here to benefit from your experience. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I, I went, to, um, went to school at Dartmouth College undergrad and then up the street at Harvard for my PhD. And uh, then I transitioned from, from science to finance. And for the last eight years, I've been working at Morgan Stanley, working with uh, Vasily Strela, the instructor in the course. Um, so today, what are we going to be talking about? Well, just to give you a, a big picture view of where our topic fits within the grand scheme of finance. In general, there are really two big areas in my, in my view where, well, there's probably more, but these are the kind of most famous, I would say, areas where quantitative uh, skills can be, uh, are very valuable in finance. And the two areas are, one, one area is, is statistics, predictions, which is uh, essentially said, um, given some historical behavior in the market, how do we predict what will happen in the future? And that's, uh, that's certainly a huge industry. People have made a ton of money applying quantitative concepts to that. And, um, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. What we're going to talk about is uh, another very big area called uh, pricing, uh, which is pricing and hedging of complex instruments. And th that area is really, it's really about um, essentially when you have a, a complex product that you don't really know the price of, but you do know the prices of other products, and then you can, know, you can use the other products to essentially replicate the payoff of your complex product, then you can use mathematical techniques to essentially say, look, um, the main statement is, hey, because I can replicate my payoff, and I, because I, using products that I know the price of, then that means that I, I can say something about the price of my complex product. I can basically price it. And not only can I price it, but I can also, um, when I give the price, I know that I can eliminate any uncertainty from uh, owning the product by, by executing a hedging and replication strategy, at least theoretically speaking. right? So that's the area we're going to focus today. And our, our main, main focus is going to be on FX, a foreign exchange, interest rates and credit, and it's particular about credit FX hybrid models. We're going to be talking about essentially what happens, uh, why do we need credit FX hybrid models, and go, going through an example of a simple one and how to apply it. In particular, in terms of mathematical techniques we're going to be using, uh, as I said, we're going to be talking about risk neutral pricing, which is essentially a replication. And we're going to talk about uh, how to use jump processes, which is um, you might have seen in other parts of your studies as Poisson processes, to, to describe certain behaviors of um, price behavior that, that you cannot really describe very easily using pure diffusion Brownian motions that you probably have, so f have seen so far in, in the course. And uh, why do we care about that? Well, there are certain financial applications where this is important, and in particular, uh, something that happened in the last few years, this, the sovereign crisis in Europe, and also it has happened not just last year, it's happened many times in other parts of emerging markets. And given the emerging markets in my background, I've uh, worked on these kind of models. And this is uh, when you have uh, bond, Greek bonds in euros and, and there is a potential for Greek default. And as we know, as, we, as you might have um, read in the news, there was a really a big worry about what will happen to the euro currency if there is a spate of sovereign defaults. And in fact, euro currency did, in anticipation of possibility of default, it actually did depreciate for a while 
back in 2000, um, 2011 and, and 2012. And now it's pretty much back where, where it was before that, but it certainly there was, a, there was a fear in the market, which was also very, very obvious in, in terms of option prices, that euro currency could depreciate significantly if, in fact, the, uh, a disorderly default happened. Now, it didn't happen, so that's kind of uh, that's good. But in other emerging markets in history, it has happened before. So it's not, it's not really a kind of an empty question. So foreign exchange, how do we describe it in math finance? Well, we think of it as the price of a unit of foreign currency in dollars. We, in our presentation, we're going to denote the spot effects rate, which is the current rate of exchange by S. And here is a sample graph of Euro USD effects rate. You can see it looks like a random walk. Um, it, it's very, very well described in normal circumstances, a random walk. So one um, kind of very fundamental property uh, that connects FX and interest rates, interest rates is uh, the so-called FX forward interest rate parity, which says if, uh, if I have a certain amount of money in this example of $5 million, I really have, um, if, if I, and I can invest it, there's two ways that I can utilize this money to, uh, one way is to just invest it at a, dollar kind of risk-free rate, and we're assuming here we have a risk-free rate, so that was a standard assumption. Or we can do something like we can take the money, exchange it into, into say, euros, invest it using the euro risk-free rate, and then exchange it back into dollars. And if we're, and uh, this is essentially used to, to replicate, to price FX forward contracts. So FX forward contracts are contract that allow you to say, look, I'm going to agree with you that in one month's time, I'm going to say, give you um, 4, 4 million 108 and 405 euros, and you're going to give me back $5,170,000. It's, it's essentially an agreement. It's a derivative contract. And if you, see the, if you have this forward contract, you can lock in, essentially, through conversion in euros, you can lock in an effective dollar interest rate. So FX forwards can be essentially described fully by knowing the interest rates in each currency and the spot effects rate. Conversely, you can infer foreign interest rates knowing the effects forwards. They're, they're very connected. So yes? In this example, there's no mispricing, so you get back the same amount. Is that the idea? In this example, there is no mispricing. You get back the same amount. So uh, we're assuming essentially that there is no arbitrage. Uh, we're not assuming, but we're given if the prices were indeed, if this interest rate 4.6% in euros, interest rate was 4.6 and in dollars is 3.4, and here are the current spots, which is 127 and the forward 125. If these were in fact the, the, the observable mark quantities in the market, then there would be no arbitrage. And there is, you're basically indifferent whether you invest the money in dollars or you go the way of exchanging into euros and invest in euros and then back into dollars. So in this example, I have the way I've, I've presented and worked it out, there is no arbitrage. Now, if some of these numbers say, if the interest rate in euros were 4% instead of 4.6 and all the other quantities were the same, then in fact, there would be arbitrage. And you could make money by borrowing money in dollars and you know, investing. I mean, this, the purpose of this slide is really to illustrate kind of, hey, if there's no arbitrage, how, how one would actually compare, how one would actually look for arbitrage in this example. Uh, this is, again, this is a little bit of definition, what are um, interest, compound interest, interest rates. We, um, we're, talking, we're going to talk about instantaneous risk-free rates. We're going to, again, say they're risk-free, so we're not, basically, we know for sure that we're going to get our money back. You can think of risk-free rates as, as the one that uh, treasuries pay or in real life or the one that Federal Reserve guarantees on deposits. There are various, uh, various examples of risk-free rates, and while in practice, different risk-free rates can actually be different, so they're not really risk-free, but in our in our world right now, in our model, we're going to assume that there is such a thing as a risk-free risk rate for every currency, and it's unique. And now, as we talk about our dynamics of the interest rate, of the, sorry, the effects process, 
what we're really focused on here is, a, is an effect. We're making an effects model. And we want to see, in the previous example, we saw hey, here, given an effects rate and given some interest rates, here is what the effects forward really has to be in order to have no arbitrage. Well, now when we're trying to describe, when we try to describe a, define a process for the effects currency, essentially this kind of no arbitrage condition leads to having a certain um, have, leads to having a certain constraints on what the stochastic differential equation has to be. So in this particular case, the constraint is that um, the drift of the process has to be the differential in interest rates. So if one currency pays more than the other currency, obviously people would want to invest in that currency. So that, in order for no arbitrage to exist, there has to be an expectation that currency would, the currency that pays more would depreciate in the future. Otherwise, it would be an arbitrage. So if it doesn't depreciate, if, if, you, if you can sign up say, hey, this currency won't depreciate, then you can just always invest in that currency that pays higher interest rates and make money, which, in fact, many people do. But again, that's a, they're taking a certain risk. They're taking the risk that the currency will depreciate. So what do we actually want? Uh, what we want is to say we want to essentially enforce these uh, arbitrage conditions from before, which is to say that my forward rate has to be essentially the spot rate, um, has, to, has to be the spot rate time, uh, well, this condition here has to be observed, essentially. And what does that mean? It means that my forward rate has to be my spot. What did you say? Yes, yeah. My spot rate has to, my forward rate has to be equal to the spot rate times, um, times essentially the interest rate differential. If that is true, then, then uh, this previous condition, the previous, uh, risk, the the, in the previous setup, there will be no arbitrage. And why is that? Well, that's because, you know, the, the, am the amount of money I earn on the, on the domestic leg is um, e to the rd. The amount of money I earn on the foreign leg is e to the rf, but then I multiply it by, by the forward, and that has to equal to the e to the rd. So um, this is a standard, this is a very basic, this is the most basic dynamic FX model that, um, that people use in industry. It's kind of referred to as the Black-Scholes FX model. And in the stock price, you've, you've seen if, uh, int stochastic models before. Usually, S is a stock price when people talk about options. In, uh, in that case, this, um, this drift is just, um, it's just a risk-free interest rate. Well, here in FX, it's, it's a differential of interest rates. Otherwise, it's very similar. So it has some, FX has some interesting properties. So we're going to talk about the game, and before we go to that game, one question: Can FX exchange rate can ever be? Is, can it ever be negative? What do you guys think? Can dollar euro exchange rate be negative? Any ideas? No, it, it's hard. Because what does it negative mean? It means um, I have to pay you money to give you euros. Why, why would you have to, that, or you have to pay me money to give me euros? Nobody would do that. It can be zero potentially if, if say, dollars are worthless or something. But you can, but it's really it cannot really be negative. So that's one reason why I wrote um, my SDE as a as a kind of a log normal process. You recognize this by by the form ds over s. So the changes in in the fx are proportional to the value of the effect. So the, vo the process can never become negative. OK, so it can, it can never become negative, but how big can it get? And the answer is it can get very big. I mean, we have currencies, um, notably some currencies like Zimbabwean dollars that traded, I don't know. I mean, I actually don't know where Zimbabwean dollars traded, but I, I think it's somewhere in the billions of Zimbabwean dollars per, per dollar or something like that. Some really extreme examples. It can really get extremely big. So there is no really upper bound. 
while there is a lower bound. So the distribution, as you can imagine, has a skew. It's not symmetric around the, around the average. It's, it's limited on the, on the lower side. It can go very high on the high side. And log normal distribution has that property. Have you guys seen log normal distribution? You've talked about this stuff in the course before, right? So let's go back to our game. Um, so our game is we have assumptions. Uh, our, our, and my assumptions are not to be realistic, but to make it simple. Let's assume that our dollars and euros uh, exchange rate is 1, so we can exchange 1 euro for 1 dollar. Clearly not exactly the case, but let's make that assumption. And we also assume that the FX forwards is 1, which basically means that the interest rates in both currencies are the same. And now, let's say I'm going to make you a bet that now dollars and euros is a, is a volatile process. It can, uh, right now it's 1, but in the future it could be different from 1. It could be higher or lower. So if dollar euro FX process is more than 1 in 1 month, then um, you give me money. And then if it's uh, less than 1 in 1 month, then I give you money. And we're going to have uh, two payoffs, so two, two games. I don't know why it says bet B. It should say just bet. I'm sorry about that. Um, that in the payoff A, basically, you're going to give me $100 if I win, and I'm going to give you $100 if you win. And in payoff B, you're going to give me 100 euros if I win, and I'll give you 100 euros if you win. And the question is, which game would you prefer to play, or do you not care? So in each case, you kind of win and lose the same number. So I want to see uh, hands. Who wants to play game A? Come on, guys. Wake up. <laughs> Who wants to play game A? I mean, if you don't know, you, you just let's say you like euros better. You can say this is not really graded, so it's OK. <laughs> OK, nobody really knows what to play. Like, how about game B? Anybody wants to play game B? OK, you guys want to play game three? Three people for game four. Game A, nobody still? Same person for game A and B, all right. <laughs> OK, two people. So now. The behavioral science says people are reluctant to lose, more reluctant to lose. That's true, that's true. That, that is true. However, like, um, so. People are reluctant to lose, and I said, look, the, the FX forward in one month is one. So that's kind of, you can actually, that's the market price that in one month the FX forward is one, and this, our bet is kind of, the strike is one, so our bet level is one. So you can kind of say, well, this looks like kind of a fair game, um, so I don't expect to win or lose much, but I'm just reluctant to do it. And I can get that feeling, that's the risk aversion aspect of it. But if you were forced to make a bet, question is, which one would you prefer? Um, so I understand that you might not want to play. But I would say, OK, so you guys don't seem to be in the mood to play. That's fine. We can, uh, we can let's, look at some, um, let's look at some scenarios. So let's say in one month, dollar euro goes to 1.25. In bet A, I lose $100. In bet B, I lose 100 euros. So bet A for, actually, you lose 100 euros, not, not you. So bet A for you, you're $25 better than bet B. And in the second case, if dollar euro is 0.75, you make $100, and, uh, you, or you make 100 euros in bet B. In that case, you're also, bet A is $25 better. So it doesn't matter what happens. Bet A seems to be the better case. So if you're like uh, our dear professor here, then you're, you don't like to lose, then you're probably going to choose bet A, I assume, right? It's a better deal. But, and that's kind of strange, though. I mean, like, you, you know, this both, both payoffs were symmetric. So you know, it's 100 euros, 100 euros, 100 dollars, 100 dollars. Why is it that one is better than the other? Well.
it's like what, what really happens is, well, the, the, the units of the bet, the value of those units depend on whether you win or lose. So it's not like if I was betting using acorns, then like you get two acorns or I get two acorns, then, then actually it might be a fair bet. But because I'm betting in euros and dollars and the value of these things, the relative value changes compared based on, based on the actual whether you win or lose, then, then, it's not, then the game is not symmetric anymore. So this is um, the reason why I wanted to take you through this game is because there is a lot of cases in finance where people make bets, but then the value of what you get depends on whether you win or you lose. And that has, a, that has an effect on the value of the bet. And in particular, the case we're going to talk about today is one of these cases, which is the credit effects. Um, that's why we need credit effects quantum models. To give you an illustration from, from finance, like let's take Italy bonds. So Italy issues bonds both in dollars and in euros. Why does it issue in both currencies? Because Italy has to issue a lot of bonds. And they, uh, they need to find as many investors as they, as they can. And some investors want to buy euro bonds, and some investors want to buy dollar bonds. And they want to access both bases of investors. Now, these bonds, um, they, they cross default, meaning if, they, if Italy defaults on one bond, all of its bonds default together, including the euros and the dollar bonds. So then you know, the, the, there, is a, there is the notion of credit spread which is the measure of how risky Italy is. So you can take euro bonds and you can say, well, how much premium does Italy pay over German bonds? Let's assume that German bonds are risk-free, which is kind of the standard assumption for euros, that the German bonds, Germany is the, uh, is the main underlying economic force for the euro. They, they are kind of risk-free bonds. And Italy pays a certain spread over euros. Same. Same thing for dollars. It pays a certain spread over, over USA. So if Italy wants to borrow money, they have to pay a higher interest rate. Just like if you want to borrow money for student loans, you have to pay higher interest rate than the Fed. It's, uh, and the size of that spread is uh, in the market. It determines on how risky of a borrower you are. Well, it turns out that these spreads are not, not the same in both currencies. There is, uh, some, one currency has a higher spread than other currencies. That's kind of an interesting thing. So there is uh, two questions, really. When the spreads are not the same, which, which currency would Italy prefer to issue bonds, bonds in, and which currency do investors prefer to buy bonds in? So this is kind of uh, similar, if you think, then um, to the previous game we played. Because if you're an investor trying to buy bonds, well, if Italy defaults, then chances are euro is not doing so well. So you would lose money. And if you have euro bonds, you would lose euros. If you, lose, if you have dollar bonds, you'd lose dollars. On the other hand, if Italy does not default and pays you back, then, then chances are the euro is not doing that bad. So you would actually be making euros and dollars. So it's, um, it's an interesting, uh, it's kind of a similar, similar dynamic going on. So that's the same kind of question that I asked before. USD, Euros, or equal in both. So what do, you, what do you think now? Now that we've gone through that example, maybe we'll have a higher participation in my, in my pub quiz. Uh, who, thinks that, um, who thinks that USD bonds have a higher credit spread? And who thinks so? A, votes for A. One, two. So, and who thinks that Euro bonds will have a higher credit spread? OK, one. All right. So two to one. I think the two, two, guy, the two to one wins. All right. <laughs> I must say, uh, you guys uh, seem that maybe it's the format of the auditorium. People don't like to raise their hands too much. Or maybe they're afraid that they're being filmed. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> OK. Well, how are we going to? Uh, how are we going to, to do this? Um, how are we going to answer this question? Before I give you the answer, we're going to go through this slide. Well, first we're going to say, well, FX rates are volatile. There is volatility, as we said before. So now we're going to, there is a, 
in order to compare euro bonds to dollar bonds, we need to really come up with a strategy to replicate one with the other, and then look at the price. Look at the uh, how much do we need to buy one to replicate the other. If you if we are able to come up with such a replication strategy, then we can immediately say, hey, if you need like 150 bonds to of euro bonds to replicate a, a hundred dollar bonds, then then that means that the, the euro bonds have to be cheaper. Right? That's, that's basically the replication argument. So you can kind of try to do that by piecing together bonds, or you can use the powerful tools of mathematical finance that you've been learning about, which is all about replication and pricing. And the three steps are, you know, we're going to analyze the payoffs of the instruments, and we're going to write some um, model, a model for FX and for credit, and we're going to price those bonds. And then we're going to look at the results and try to understand the problem intuitively. And that's basically what we do pretty much. Um, that's what option, strat option quants do in Wall Street all the time. So here is the answer. Uh, dollar versus euro spreads from the marketplace. So you, usually what happens in, uh, in this kind of questions in finance is you kind, of, you kind of have an answer, and then you try to come up with a model that explains the difference. So that's kind of what we're going to do now. Um, well, the, um, the USD spreads are actually lower. USD, USD bond spreads are actually lower. OK. Now, so there is really, um, when we're talking about bonds, risky bonds, there's two states. They're either performing or they are or they are which is or non performing in default. And we're gonna go here through an example of uh, of two bonds, and we're going to use two zero coupon bonds, which essentially have zero recovery. Um, it's and the idea there is um, really to to make it uh, to make the question simple so we can analyze it better. But uh, you don't lose a lot of generality by saying zero coupon versus coupon. It's, it's not the, the answer. The, the intuition would be exactly the same. So let's say we have two zero coupon bonds, same maturity. They pay 100 at maturity. By the way, bonds, I don't know how much you guys have uh, this. Uh, I say these things. I'm very familiar with them. Bonds are nothing more than loans. So a zero coupon bond means I give you some amount of money, and it, it at some matu pre-agreed maturity, you're going to pay me 100. So let's say I give you 80 cents. One year from now, you pay me 100. And I call this a zero coupon bond because you don't pay me any intermediate coupons. There's no interest payments, but just I pay you less money now and you pay me more at, at maturity. OK, so um, we know that uh, bond U pays $100, bond E pays 100 euros. And let's say there's, uh, we denote the prices of price of U is PU, price of E is PE. Our spot FX rate, we're going to call it ST. Our FX forward, FT. Now, um, we can have kind of a simple arbitrage strategy. Well, let's say if we, we can sell 100 times FT dollar bonds, and with the proceeds buy 100 FT a uh, hundred. We, we're gonna get if we sell a thousand. Sorry, one thousand dollar bonds. We're gonna get this much uh, proceeds. So that's the price. And if we buy a hundred euro bonds and a thousand, sorry, euro bonds. So um, we can enter into into an FX forward contract for a um, hundred thousand euros for maturity P of zero cost. All right. So let's see how. Um, how this uh, strategy actually pays out. Well, what happens is you get, you get, um, you pay 100,000, like you, there's 100,000 euros, you get 100,000 euros for selling the euro bonds. You pay 100,000 times FT dollars, say the dollar bonds. There is a FX forward contract, and at maturity, you can exchange this $100,000 for 100,000 euros using the FX forward contract. You've already pre-agreed to do that. 
So your fx forward actually exactly hedges. Uh, you can basically use the proceeds of these bonds to, to ex you can exchange the proceeds at zero cost at, mat at maturity because you have entered into the FX, FX forward contract. So your net payoff is zero. So that means that the prices of these bonds have to be the same. But what if they're not? What if FT, which is the FT in this case is one uh, forward contract. What if the price in dollars is different from exchange rate times the price in euros? Well, in that case, you can say, well, there is an arbitrage. And you'd be right if uh, you kind of make, you, you would be able to make, or make money if, in fact, the bonds performed. But what if, ha what if happens if there is a default? Or if there is a default, um, if there is a default, that wouldn't really necessarily be the case. Because if there is a default, these bonds don't pay anything, and you just have an FX forward contract. And this FX forward contract is going to be worth something after default, especially if FX inter if the FX rate depends, like jumps upon default. So arbitrage again is so you start with zero money, you make money if there is non-zero probability. And um, let's say in this particular case, the strategy payoff in case of default with 25% recovery rate is you actually have only 25% means you only have a quarter of the payoff now at maturity if default occurs, but you have a hedge for the full 100,000. Your FX forward is for a full 100,000. So the 20, for 25,000 of it, you can use the FX forward to exchange money. For the remaining 75,000, you just have an FX forward outright. So if FX moved against you, you would lose money. So that's why the strategy is not necessarily an arbitrage, and that's why the two prices of the dollar and euro bond are not necessarily related to each other. They don't have to be equal, because, in fact, um, there, there is a possibility of default, and you cannot really directly hedge. Um, you cannot really construct an arbitrage strategy by using FX forwards and the bonds together so easily. You have to take into account what happens if default occurs. OK, so give you an example. What happens upon FX when default occurs? Well, one of the most recent defaults of a country, of a big country that has its own currency, is Argentina, 2001. And when it defaulted, the Argentinian peso skyrocketed. Here's the graph of, of, the, of the price series. So if you had Argentinian, if you had an FX forward contract, that essentially, if you had a position where you were left with a naked FX forward contract where you were receiving pesos and paying dollars in the event of default, you would have lost a lot of money when that default happened. It would have really gone against you. And this is, by the way, this is a, this is a massive move. And the Argentinian peso still is not recovered from, from that default. So can we do better? What, what do we actually, what should we be doing when we're hedging this? And the answer is, uh, again, we have to apply mathematical models uh, to really try to come up with a replication strategy. So what is the main features of a model that would help me do this? Well, first I need to model a credit default, the credit default event. I need to have this in my model. And I need to have something which says FX has to move upon default. And then we're going to construct a complete market. And then we're going to define some simple dynamics on our exchange rate and on our, on our defaults. And, and we're going to try to price for bonds. So um, how do we do that? Well, what we generally, again, how are we going to use the models? We're going to define an SDE. Just like I defined define initially, a DS over S is something. Then I'm going to solve this SDE using either analytically or numerically. And um, what's, what's important, the way we actually use these models in trading, we're going to look at how the price of each, of each instrument depends on, on the hedging instrument. And that's going to define my hedge ratio or my replicating strategy. That's really the kind of the main part. It, it's really hedging and valuation and pricing are really the same 
right and left hand is, is really talking about the same thing. You cannot really price without hedging, and pricing without hedging is kind of meaningless in some sense. Pricing represents the price of a hedging strategy. OK. So uh, how do we a basic credit model? How do we model default? Well, the standard model in finance for default is to define the default events. And we say, well, this default event arrives as a, is a, is a discrete event. And it arrives at, a, at the time tau, which is a random time. And um, we're going to model that tau, the time, as a Poisson process, which means that we don't know when it's going to come, but we know something about the probabilities of when it's coming. And the Poisson process has an intensity. The intensity in this case is h. And basically, the, mean, the, the meaning of intensity means the probability of the default time not arriving by time capital T is, is um, e to the minus h times capital T minus little t. Little t means your little t is now. Let's say we're saying at time little t, we know the default has not arrived. Here's the probability the default would not arrive by some time t later. So in our model, we're going to make a simple assumption, let's say constant hazard rate. And we can, uh, since we know the probability of default time not arri arriving after a certain time capital T, that's like a cumulative distribution, we can also look, uh, find the probability density that default time happens at some time capital T, or like around some time epsilon around, cap around capital T. It's just a derivative of the, um, of the cumulative distribution. And uh, corollary is that the, the probability density of default at any given time is h, which is essentially the limit of capital T going to little t. So now, what happens to, in our model, what happens to fx rate? Well, fx rate is going to be denoted by s. And fx rate right after default would equal to fx rate before default times um, E to, the, um, e to the power j. And j essentially is our kind of percent devaluation, you can think of it. So if um, you can, it's kind of like a percent devaluation. So if j can go from minus infinity to infinity. If j is 0, then that means that there's no devaluation. So you can see the log of, s, of st basically jumps by, by j. So in a log normal in a log normal process, a log of st is normal, and essentially it's just a, a shift of the normal distribution. Okay, so how do we describe this? We define a jump from default for some process with intensity h, as uh, on the board, and um, our fx dynamics. And I apologize for the small small script. Is that um, our d log of s would have some, uh, some drift, mu t dt, and then a jump process j dn. So this is slightly different from what you've seen so far. So far you've seen uh, Brownian motions. This is uh, j dn. This is now a jump process. Now what we want, again, is um, you know, what we want is uh, from our, we want still our standard no arbitrage condition to remain constant. And from before, we had a condition that ex expected value of s of t has to be s of 0 times e to the um, rf minus rd times, um, times t. Right. So that, that still has to be the case. Um, and in our case, uh, we're going to assume that Rf and Rd are both um, are both um, zero. So, in our case, we're going to ask for basically a zero interest rate environment to make again the model simple. Then we just want the expected value of Ft to be as zero. So, how do we achieve that? Well, we need to show essentially that this uh, this mu, the drift, has to equal to um, this expression here, h times 1 e to the j. That's known as the compensator term. And you can think, you can imagine this as a formula. Like if, if I have a Poisson process that has a possibility of jumping up, 
then in order for that Poisson process to be on average to be equal to the initial value, it has to be like kind of trending down most of the time. And then, um, and then so that when the possibility of jump is there, the average of the two can be, can be 0. So that's, com that's known as a compensator term of the Poisson process. OK, so we can go through and, uh, and derive how that's, um, how do we get, to, we're not, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to check that this form actually does indeed give you um, that expectation, does satisfy the condition for that expectation. OK, so again, we start with um, the ST is, is um, mu to t. So it's going to be, in, in our case, it's going to be um, h times 1 minus the j times the indicator function of tau bigger than t plus j dn t. OK. So um, we, and we're, we're not, not dst, sorry, d, this is d of log of st. OK. So now um, what do we want to do? We want to integrate this, this equation. So we essentially, what we're going to do, we're going to write integral from 0 to capital T of d of log st. We integrate both sides. Integral from 0 to capital T, h 1 minus e to the j tau is um, bigger than t times, here has a dt in here, times dt plus um, integral from 0 to t of j dn t. OK, so um, then this side just gives me essentially the um, log of st over S0. This is just basic calculus. And then here we have, um, we can, this indicator function just says um, if tau is bigger than t, it's 1. If tau is less than t, then it's 0. That's, that's basically what it is. So I know that essentially when t this is, o this is only 1 when t is less than tau. So I can, my integral goes from 0 to tau now. I can replace this from an integral from 0 to tau. And I can take out the indicator function now of h 1 minus e to the j dt. And um, then I can say, well, what if? Uh, what if tau is um, bigger than there is? There is also the there is a possibility here that tau is um, this is I would say this is possibility. This is tau is less than capital T, and there's also a possibility that tau is greater than capital T, right? In which case, if tau is greater than capital T, this integral is there without any indicator functions, right? So it, again, integral from 0 to capital T of h 1 minus e to the j dt times indicator function tau being greater than capital T. So I kind of divided, um, divided this in this uh, sp counting both possibilities separately, essentially. And now the second part, integral from 0 to capital T of j d n t. Now n is, uh, is, what was n? Well, n of t is essentially, um, it starts out at, well, it starts out as, as 0 for t less than, t less than tau, and then becomes 1 for t bigger than tau. So, This integral is just j is a constant, so it's just j times n of t. 
and this is capital T here. And by the way, all these um, all this derivation is posted on the node, so you don't necessarily have to worry if you can't. Um, can I move this board up? Not really. How does it work? OK. So I'm going to do one more line. I'm going to erase this top line. So we got to here, and there's one more step, which is now to actually do the integration. Um, we're going to have log of st over s0. Well, uh, two things. Now, if tau is less than t, so default happened before capital T, then what is nt? nt is going to be 1. So I can say. This equals to h tau times 1 minus e to the j. This is the first, in this integral now, um, plus j. So this is, this, this is if um, tau is less than t. And then if tau is bigger than t, then uh, this term is 0. This is the term that's for tau bigger than t. This is just a constant, so it just becomes h times capital T, 1 minus e to the j times indicator function of tau bigger than t, bigger, bigger than equal t. And we can then exponentiate both sides, and it becomes, um, here's the magic of the blackboard. You can erase st equals m s0 times the exponential of this. So I've kind of, here is my, um, this is my exchange, this is what my exchange rate is going to be, essentially, at, uh, ca at time capital T. Now what was I trying to do? I was trying to do this, right, to compute this expectation. Well, to compute the expectation, now I have to integrate over the probability distribution of tau. Now remember, probability distribution of tau is a Poisson process. So we have essentially, um, I'll write it here, phi of um, 0 t is just a h times e to the minus h t. That's the um, kind of the probability density of tau. So now what I need to do is essentially the expectation of s t is just integral from 0 to infinity of s of tau times phi 0 tau d tau. So here is my s of t. You can think of this s of t of tau for time tau. So this is for a given time tau. I know what my, what my value of s of t is. So I can do this integral. And now we're going to do it. Um, so what is going to be the first term? So the exponential of s of, of st, not exponential, but the expectation of st is going to be um, first. So it's going to be integral from 0 to capital T. It's going to have two terms. First, I'm going to integrate from 0 to capital T. And then I'm going to integrate from capital T to to infinity. So I'll split this integral into two parts. And from 0 to capital T, I have essentially um, so h times e to the minus h tau. And this is my density function. And then I'm going to plug that in here. So this is for tau being less than t. So it's basically this first term. I'm going to divide this by s0 here gonna, just to make it easy. So first term is going to be e to the h tau times 1 minus e to the j plus j. OK? And um, 
so this is d tau. So this is the first part from 0 to t. And the second part is essentially the integral from capital T to infinity for, um, for tau being bigger than capital T. Now that's actually, this part here does not depend on tau. It's a constant. So it would be just h capital T 1 minus e to the j times what's the probability of, uh, of tau being bigger than capital T? Well, it's just uh, that's the cumulative probability distribution we saw before, just e to the minus ht. That's the probability that tau is bigger than t. OK, so and what I should split, it's e to the ht 1 minus e to the j okay, times e to the minus ht. So I can now simplify this expression somewhat. Uh, you can see that, say, this term and this term, this term and this term go away. And um, also, this term and this go away. So I'm left with um, integral from 0 to t of um, essentially um, h times e to h tau minus h tau e to the j times e to the j, right? So you can think of this as h times e to the j times e to the minus h tau e to the j d tau plus e to the minus h capital T times e to the j. So this is, if I think of h e to the j, as, as, as this is the constant in front of tau. This is just a normal, this is just a standard um, integral of exponential. So this just becomes essentially e to the um, e to the minus h t e to the j minus 1 plus i to the minus h t e to the j. And um, these two terms are going to cancel out, and I'm going to have 1. So again, the ratio of e to the st over s0 just gives you 1. So all this is just to kind of show you a little bit how you work with uh, jump processes and you take expectations. It's not nothing really you haven't seen in terms of math. It's just slightly different from Brownian motions. But it's still the same idea. You have dn, and you have a compensator term. So this here proves that, essentially, my drift guess that I started with, uh, in fact, does produce, uh, does make my expectation 0. OK, so what have we done so far? We have defined the dynamics for log of s. We jump on default, defined probability density. And now we have to derive kind of dynamics of s, price euro bonds, hedge ratios, and so on. OK. so. Um, Log of s dynamics, we, and I apologize again for the small font. We have here, we have the log s dynamics um, applying, applying Ito's lemma. Ito's lemma, there is, a, there is an equivalent. Um, Ito's lemma, you know from Brownian motion, but there is another one for Poisson for processes as well. And that is, Ito's lemma is like the chain rule. So if you know the process for for some for some um, say log of s, how do you find the process for s itself? Well, in uh, in this case, um, what's going to happen is our ds over s is going to be um, yeah, the same drift h times one h to the minus j times less than t dt. Sorry, t less than tau. Plus um, the e to the j minus one. So the j minus one times dn. Okay. Dn t. So that's the uh, that's the, that's really the uh, the derivation of um, 
that's the derivation of um, of the um, that that's the final result for the, for s. Now, how do we get to this? Well, th maybe I should I I can write Ito's lemma. What does it say? Ito's lemma is basically says that if we have the xt is equal to mu dt plus j dn, then and you have a function y of t, which is f of x t, then dy is um, df dx mu dt plus f of x t plus j minus f of x t d n t. So you can it's it's um, this is the kind of the term that the kind of the analog analog of the convexity term in uh, in your Brownian motion it was lemma. But it's now for jump processes. So this f of x t plus j and f of x t. So what happens essentially to so you have some function f, and, and x t plus j is what happens if a jump happens, and x t is, is before the jump. So kind of the effect of the jump on the function, that's that's what this term is. That's like the convexity term. I think of it as a convexity term. I don't know how it's called. Maybe the more mathematical minds here. Um, so in our case, if you look at the top equation, um, our Function is just uh, essentially the exponent, and uh, what happens is when when the function goes up by j, is that the exponent uh, goes e to the j minus e to zero. That's it. That's what this term is. Okay. So that's how you uh, that's how you write the equation, and now the SDE solving the SDE. Solving the SD generally means like write down what S is. So we have S of T in our case. It's going to be um, S of little t. Well, I'm, I'm not going to write it. You can have it on the board because I think we're getting, we're going to get late. So hurry up a little bit. We go on to the next part, which is the um, pricing exercise. So we have two bonds. Zero coupons, zero recovery bonds. One pays one dollar, one the other pays one euros. So, um, we're, how are we going to price this? We have to use our model. We have a model for the effects rate. We have a model for credit. So we can price price both bonds in dollars. Uh, what is the price in dollars for each bond? And the ratio of prices kind of gives you the ratio of the notionals in your hedge portfolio if you want to hedge one against the other. So. It's a zero coupon bond. So I wrote here the bond dollar bond price is this. So why is that? Why do I write it like that? Well, it's it's a zero coupon bond. So what does zero coupon bond say? As I said, in at maturity it pays one. So we have something where the payoff at time t is either one if if tau is um, bigger than t, or zero if tau is um, less than t. Okay, so now what is my price? Well, I know that um, standard pricing theory tells me that I, I kind of my the price at time at time little t is equal to there is a to to expectation. I have a price at time big T, and you can kind of say there is a money market account, but money market accounts in our case is uh, just one because interest rates are zero. So you can just, that, that's really just the case. That's just true. So now the expectation of this, well, that's just equal to the expectation of an indicator function of tau bigger than T, which just equals to the probability of tau bigger than t. 
So if that's true, uh, that we know what that is, that's just the uh, probability, that's the cumulative probability function e to the minus ht. That's why the price of the bond in dollars has to be e to the minus ht. Um, Euro bond price, same idea, except um, but, so Euro, Euro bond price in dollars is that. So why 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 is the Euro bond bond price in dollars like that? Well, um, the Euro bond price in dollars again. What is the payoff? Same payoff except. The payoff is in euros, right? So if I want to do the, p the payoff of my bond in dollars, so this is, I'm going to call this the, the euro bond. But the payoff now, if I want to do it in dollars, is not really one. It's it's one times um, s of t and zero times s of t. That's really my payoff. So my so then the expectation here is not just one, but actually s of t. So now I have something where I have to take the expectation of s of t, essentially, at maturity. That's my, 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 little, my bond price in euros is equal to the expectation of s of t. And what is my expectation of s of t? Well, it's, um, it's um, e to the minus ht times e to the j. And that's the expectation of s of t, indicator function of tau bigger than t, right? So not just exp expectation of s of t is s of 0, but expectation of s of t times the indicator function only if the case is of tau bigger than capital T. Now, that's not s0. That's, s that's basically this, e to the minus ht times e to the j. OK. So, What can we do? Well, we construct a, what we should do is uh, we construct a portfolio at time equals 0, which is we sell $1 bond, and we buy this much amount here of euro bonds. And the portfolio value at time equals t equals 0 is 0. Um, basically, you can take so e to the ht. The first bond, you would get e to the minus ht. And from the second amount would cost you e to the minus ht to buy. That's how I've chosen this uh, scaling factors. We have started a portfolio which costs 0. And um, I should probably, I'm going to go back here and, and um, I'm going to write down the notionals because we lost them. So how many dollar bonds do we have? We have minus one. And how many euro bonds do we have? We have um, e to the minus ht times um, one minus e to the j. This is how many bonds we have. How many bonds we have? Okay. So sometime delta t later, what happens to our bond prices? Well, we know what the bond prices are. The only thing that changed was that time, some time expired. So now instead of capital T, we have T minus delta T to expiration. So these are the bond prices if we didn't default. Of course, if we defaulted, then the bond prices are 0. So obviously, if we defaulted, since uh, bond, both bond prices are 0, we started with a portfolio that's worth 0. If default happened, now we have a portfolio that's worth 0. So nothing changed, right? So the key part is, OK, now, what if the fault didn't happen? Would we have the same price as well? That's what we want to check. So and if we have the same price, both in the case of default and in the case of no default, then that means we have essentially a, 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 a replicated portfolio, a hedge portfolio. OK, so what is the value of the bonds if the fault did not happen? Again, we have. Um, this is the dollar bonds here, and these are the euro bonds, and this is my effects rate. Why did my effects rate move? Well, because 
the fall did not happen, so jump did not happen, but still I have my drift, a compensator drift, so Fx drifts in, in the opposite direction. Okay, so um, this is so the dollar bond, dollar bond there was there was one bond, minus one bond, and the price, so the value of the dollar bond is just um, minus e to the minus h t minus delta t. What about the euro bonds? Well, the euro bonds, here is the number of bonds we have. This is this divided by a zero, by the way, yeah. In our case, a zero is one, so it doesn't matter. But price of each bond, again, we, get, we take that from, um, the price of each bond comes from, comes from this formula. And then the FX rate, we multiply by the FX rate. And then when you actually multiply all these guys out, you end up with, um, with essentially the value in dollars of your euro bonds equals, again, the value of, of your dollar bonds. So we started out with a portfolio that was worth zero. And then some time delta t later, it's worth zero ag again, both in the, case of, um, in the case of default and in the case of no default. So there's no arbitrage. In some sense, not terribly surprising because we actually derive these prices based on the assumption of no arbitrage. But it's a good check. It kind of tells you, hey, if I actually follow this model to hedge, I'm really going to be hedged. And I'm going to be hedged not just when default occurs or only if default does not occur, but I'm hedged in both situations, if default occurs and default does not occur. And you can't really do that unless you have models that actually um, that are that are hybrid models that, that are, allow you to to mix and match to basically describe both the current events and the FX process. So that's um, that's kind of the, the usefulness. Now, and the hedging strategy, you can see. It's uh, it's interesting that the hedging strategy a the hedge ratio depends on the credit riskiness. So how much bonds we bought depends on j. Well, first depends on h, the credit riskiness, and it also depends on j, the jump size. So it really depends how many bonds you use, how many euro bonds you buy to hedge your dollar bonds. It depends on both the probability of default and on the jump size. So that's, uh, that's what I mean by that, it's, um, that it depends on credit riskiness. It's also dynamic in the sense that for a given amount of dollar bonds, the amount of euro bonds you need to sell is going to vary as, as, in, as effects and, and, uh, and uh, time goes, goes forward. As you can see, like if you have like one day before, before uh, expiration, the hedge ratio of the two are going to be different than, the, than one year before expiration. So you'd have to be rebalancing your portfolio continuously, which is not, again, not unusual. Like if you're hedging an option, you always have to also have to rebalance. But it's not, it's different from, say, a static, model, a static replication strategy where you say, oh, I'm going to buy X amount of euro bonds and X amount of dollar bonds, and I won't have to ever worry about it. It's not really the case. Here you're saying, well, I buy these ratio bonds, and if default does not happen, I'm going to have to readjust my ratio because the original ratio took, took into account the probability of default happening. And if default did not happen, now I have some information, extra information, and that now I have to readjust my ratio to reflect that. So what happens if recovery is bigger than zero? And by the way, uh, how much time do we have? Just a quick check. Um, we have about 4 o'clock here. OK, so we have about like 12 minutes, 10, 10 minutes. OK, good. So what happens is ca in case uh, recovery is bigger than zero? Um, well, if recovery is bigger than zero, we can go through this exercise that we did again, the pricing exercise, and see what happens to um, what happens to our bond prices. So, let's say let's do this for for dollars and euro bonds, just to give an example of some of the complexity that can arise when you start uh, making the model more realistic, because usually bonds do not have zero recovery. So then, we assume that our payoff of these zero coupon zero recovery bonds was one, if default doesn't happen, zero, if default happens. Now it's going to be 
the payoff of the dollar bond at time t is going to be 1 if default is uh, default did not happen, so if tau is bigger than t, and r if um, default was less than t. OK, so now when we price our expectation, it's, um, you know, it's going to be like this. Our, my p of little t would be just the expectation at time little t of, um, or let's say, in this case, uh, I'm going to call it expectation at the initial price at 0, the expectation of p of capital T times, um, yeah, which is equal to expectation of essentially 1 of tau bigger than t plus r1 of tau less than t. Well, a, what we have here is uh, essentially, so you can think we have uh, this first guy is going to be sick. First guy is going to be e to the, if tau bigger than t is e to the minus ht. And the second guy plus r times the uh, probability of tau being less than t is just 1 minus the probability of tau bigger than t. So 1 minus e to the minus ht, which essentially gives you r, is it r plus um, e to the minus ht times 1 minus r. Yeah. So that's how you derive uh, the dollar bond price. And for the euro bond price, you will do the same thing, except now this will be multiplied by, by the effects rate. And now the effects rate, the tricky thing about the effects rate is that it, the effects rate jumps on default. So it's not going to be the same, same number. So in this case, PT, this is for, for one kind of dollar unit. It's 1 times S of t and R times S of t. So now we have P little t, this is for euros. The price at time 0 of the euro bond divided by S0, that equals to expected value times 0 of S of t of tau bigger than t plus R S of t times tau less than t. Well, OK, so the first part, S of t tau bigger than t, that was like the zero coupon bond price. So that's just. Um, that's just essentially the, um, the, in order to really, I would say, guess this well, right, we, we have to go back to what was S of t. So let's say if we go back to the equation for S of t, to, um, let me write that. So S of t is S of little t times e to the, um, yeah. e to the h t 1 minus e to the j times um, plus j times 1 tau bigger than t plus um, no, times e to the ht. This is h tau, tau 
tau less than t. And this is if tau is less than t, and then times e to the uh, hd, 1 minus hd times uh, 1 minus e to the j, yeah. tau bigger than t. So if tau, if tau, if if the fault has not occurred, s of t is is s of um, s of um, s of zero in this case. S of t is s of zero times this term, and if the fault has occurred, then it's s of zero times this term. So the two terms are the same except for the um, for the j j part. Okay. So now when we try to do this expectation. Here we're in the situation where tau with default has not occurred. So our effects rate is essentially S0 times the second term. So we have <coughs> expectation of um, S0 times, um, well, and we're kind of dividing by S0, so um, S0 drops out. Um, e to the hd times 1 minus e to the j. Okay. And um, one tau bigger than t. That's the first, the first expectation. And the second one, ex expectation of, ah, I cannot raise this, expectation of, um, so we put this R times the expectation of uh, now here we have tau is less than t, so we're going to have it's uh, our S of t is the first part only would be true. Second part would be would be one. So that would be the formula e to the um, e to the h tau one minus e to the j plus j times 1 tau less than t. So this e to the j term that you see um, is e to the j term you see you see here in the euro price that comes from from this term here. So how do I do this expectation? Well to do this expectation again, you have to you do an integral essentially using times the, of, over the uh, integral from zero to infinity of the probability density. Since tau here is bigger than t, I'm really integrating from t to infinity. So, um, and this really here is um, this is just a constant. So um, this this first term. I'll write it here. So you have P0 over ST over S0, sorry, 0. That would be, first term would be again e to the HT 1 minus e to the J. And it's going to be integral from big T to infinity of the partial differential function. So that's just e to the minus HT. So this looks like something we've already done before in the previous calculation. So that, and then the second term is um, r times. Now we're integrating from zero to tau. Of uh, so this will be integrating from zero to t e to the h tau one minus e to the j. Plus j. Well, I can do it like this times e to the j. Let's put it like that. And um, times h times e to the minus h tau d tau. This part being the um, distribution function, probability distribution function. So again, uh, we have like this guy cancels this and what we're left with, first term gives us e to the minus hd e to the j 
plus r times um, h times e to the j times tau. This is, again, an exponent function. So we have e to the h t e to the j minus 1. Is that that's true? Right. So, or sorry, it's, it's <coughs> there's a minus sign here in front of this. The reason there's a minus sign is um, we have minus h e to the j times tau, and so we have to put a minus here in front when we do the integral. So there is a minus here in front. So. This thing is um, just a, it, it basically reduces to that expression on the board. So that's kind of, um, that's basically, um, okay, we, so this is how you extend the problem to having non zero recoveries. What you could do for um, your final paper, so, uh, if you decide to do a final paper on this topic is to uh, extend the model one step further and say, in our model, um, our FX rates jumped but did not have any diffusive elements, right? It was just our, you know, our equation was d log of s was uh, mu log of s, oh, sorry, mu dt plus um, j dnt. That was our SDE for log of s. So next step would be, hey, why don't we just add a, another term plus sigma dw? So without this jump, this is just a standard kind of log normal process that, that you don't know how to do. Now we add jump, essentially. So you take a log, log normal process, you add a jump process to it. And, you, and then repeat the same things that we, we were going through so far, pricing European, pricing euro bonds, dollar bonds, and uh, coming up with a replication strategy. This is, for example, a model that um, we're currently working to implement a, a model like that at Morgan Stanley. Um, our model has you know, non-zero interest rates. It has like dynamic interest rates, but um, so it makes it that makes it a little bit more complex. But overall, it doesn't make it too much more complex. Adding extra, in, having non-zero interest rates just kind of has an extra extra drift term that doesn't really change that much the mathematics of it. Uh, and the reason why we want to do that is because we want to be able to price essentially contracts where which are credit contingent, meaning the payoff depends on the, whether something has survived or not, whether credit default has occurred or not, and the payoff is in units, is in like foreign currency. So typical example would be a credit default swap denominated in Brazilian reais, or that, that happens, a, a credit default swap on Brazil denominated in Brazilian reais. Now, common sense is that when Brazil defaults, Brazil REI is not going to cost very much. It's, it's not going to be very valuable. Just like as we saw on the graph with Argentinian peso, which totally devalued, it will devalue as well. Now Brazil is a very big economy, strong country. So right now people are buying a lot of their bonds, people are investing in it. Um, still, it has credit risk, and you can you can buy, you can trade the credit risk, you can trade credit default swaps in dollars, and you can also enter into contracts that essentially quanto the credit risk into, into Brazilian currency itself. And to be able to really price this, we, you can do it. We've done it for many years without having a jump model. But then your hedge ratios are not very good. And you cannot really, you cannot really explain the prices you see in the market. So we're essentially implementing uh, infrastructure to, uh, we've already implemented this model, or a version of this model. But we're implementing infrastructure to kind of uh, really put it in production. As you can see, in this model now, your FX process depends on credit. So actually, 
calibration and all these things become a little bit more tricky, so which I don't want you to worry about for your final project, but I think it's a, it would be a very interesting exercise to take something like that and, um, and basically um, work out all the, all the steps. It does get a little bit more complicated because now you have to, when you're doing it was lemma, you got to do it both for diffusive processes and for, for the jump process. So you kind of have two terms in your it was lemma. But you've seen them both. They're in the class notes. So if you're so inclined, you can do it. And um, you can, once you solve the model, then you can do, you can, you can kind of check your results. You can actually build a Monte Carlo simulation or essentially run a bunch of paths where you simulate both the default and the um, diffusive part and see if your, uh, if your prices you derive analytically match with your expectations computed by Monte Carlo. This will be a good example, a good, it's always a very good check to see if, um, usually, usually we do this exercise to check if our Monte Carlo simulation is correct because we, we know that our math is right. <laughs> but you can also do it for, uh, you know, to check the other way around. Okay, so um, in real life, as, uh, as we went over, I mentioned a couple of times during the lecture, our models are more complicated. We have stochastic interest rates, stochastic hazard rates. So currently we assume that our hazard rate H is a fixed number. Uh, H can be stochastic as well. It can have its own distribution, and typically that's what we use the model in our models. Um, stochastic in FX. So when I say stochastic, both jump and diffusion processes. And then um, if you get really fancy, then you can start putting correlations between interest rates, FX, and, and hazard rates. So in particular, um, having a jump of FX on default naturally introduces a correlation between credit and inf interest rates. So, and sorry, and FX. When, FX, when credit occurs, FX devalues. So clearly, there's going to be a correlation. But there also could be a correlation between the hazard rates themselves and effects. So it's another source of correlation. And these correlations would produce different effects in the market. So um, basically, you can, you can uh, by, if you have enough data points, you'd be able to say, well, this model seems like it describes the market better than that model. B both of them produce quantum effects, though. And uh, in our, in, um, it's uh, whether we use analytic solutions or, or Monte Carlo, there are different approaches to price derivatives and compute risk. It depends really on how complex your model is. Certain, in a, for certain markets, you'd, you'd rather have a more complex model that is slower and requires Monte Carlo. So, and in other places, you'd want to have faster, more tractable models that can be you can price your derivatives analytically, but maybe your models are not, uh, they don't have as many features in them. So there's a, a whole range of models implemented for various markets in, in Morgan Stanley. So it's a, very, it's a very big area of expertise for us. So um, I think that's it. Um, I think I ran a little bit over time. Apologize, five minutes. Thank, thank you very, very much. And uh, yeah. why don't we just have a, well, thank our speaker first, I guess. <laughs> But also, I think you know, there probably are a question or two that uh, people might have. Uh, but I was wondering if we could now answer which of the Italian bets was better. Which one? Which, was the, which of the bets that we initially were considering on the Italian bonds was better? Could we answer that now? Because we, we haven't, I think. Yeah, so yeah. Let's go back. Which Italian bonds was better? What was that? Yeah. Okay, so let's try to answer that together, right? Um, and when we, we can answer it within our model, right? So in reality, there's all kinds of factors going into, into the price. So there's supply and demand, liquidity in euros, liquidity is in dollars. But let's say if you're trying to invest in euros or trying to invest in dollars, um, 
if I invest in dollars, right, if a default happens, I lose essentially, let's say the recovery was zero, so I lose all my money in dollars. So I, I thought I had some amount of dollars, default occurs, I lost my dollars. Same thing in euros. If I invest in euros, if a default occurs, I lost my euros. So how much did I lose in the case of euros and in the case of dollars? So if I invested euros, you can say, well, if a default happens, my euros are not maybe not as valuable. So euros are not as valuable. So I, I, I lost my euros, but what I lost was not as much because already it's also devalued a lot. Conversely, as we saw, because of the because of the compensator drift, remember um, when the, if, if you have a jump that makes the currency devalue upon default, the currency will tend to appreciate if default doesn't happen, because we want the ex the expected value of the currency has to be that's determined by interest rate parity, the, the first thing we talked about, the interest rate differential. So that that is kind of an ironclad arbitrage condition that you have to follow. So if you want your FX forward to really, to the expected value of your FX to, to remain fixed by the interest rate differential, and you know that upon default your currency will devalue, that means that if the currency does not devalue, it's going to appreciate. Doesn't mean if default does not happen, the currency would appreciate, relatively speaking. So in our case, when we're buying bonds, we only get paid if the default does not occur. So you'd rather, you would rather essentially buy the bonds in the currency that's going to relatively appreciate, essentially. Suppose interest rates were zero in both cases. You would rather buy the bond where, interest, where FX would appreciate if, if default does not occur. Because if it occurs, you get nothing in any case, right? But if it doesn't occur when you get paid, you want something that would appreciate versus something that would not. It's like the dollar, for example, let's say the dollar doesn't move versus other currencies when, when the euro default happens. So you'd, you'd rather get the uh, euro bond. Yeah. If you want to estimate recovery, right, um, can you use a bunch, I mean, not necessarily factors already in the model, but outside factors like, uh, um, like macroeconomic factors to predict the expected value of recovery? Absolutely, yeah. Recovery is something that we cannot really price necessarily uh, because we usually Usually we have bonds, and the bond price, uh, there is, you know, bond price, you can say we model default probability of default versus probability of non-default. But now if you introduce a second variable, which is the recovery, now you have essentially both probability of default and recovery amount as variables, and you only have price as, as your data point, and you, you can have infinitely many solutions. So typically what happens is you kind of um, fix the recovery at something. Now, what do we use to fix the recovery? Well, for sovereign countries, we use 25%. And for corporates, uh, we use 40%. But these numbers, everybody knows that they're kind of just conventions, really, more than anything. No, we, don't, we don't really believe that recovery is really 40% or 25%. It varies a lot by corporations. And there are studies by credit agencies about how much recoveries, um, what are the recoveries for, for various, um, various bonds. And this 25% for sovereigns is based on some study like that that like went over the last 50 years, looked at the recoveries of sovereigns, of which there, there are not that many every year, but if you look 50 years, there's quite a few. And then it made some statements say, oh, they, some recover higher, some recover lower, but on average they recover 25%. Now, if you remember what Greece ha what happened in Greece, how much did bondholders in Greece got for their bonds? Now, they didn't really default technically, they did default technically, but it was, it was a very managed process. But they got definitely less than 25%. I think they got something on the order of 15 cents on the dollar. So recovery there was, you can say, it was less than 25%. Less than, uh, same for uh, same, this Argentinian default that I'm talking about, the 2001. Um, Argentina is still being sued by creditors trying to get money back. Uh, from this, uh, and it's uh, like a big thing in the news. Isn't yeah. Like if you have a plane from Argentina and they fly over, it can be seized by exactly, yeah. Funds exactly, yeah. They try to do some settlements. So 
how much did people recover? Well, it depends who you are. If you took the original deal, maybe you got 20, 25, 30 cents on a dollar, maybe you got 20 cents on a dollar. But now if you hold out, if you held out, apparently you got a little bit more eventually. So it's a little bit of a fuzzy concept. It can, but it's not something you usually you make an assumption of what it is. And, and a related question: So, how how would we also estimate uh, the other constants like the the hazard rate and, and the J? Rate? So once you fix R, once you fix the recovery rate, then you can take the bond price, and because bond price theoretically is e to the minus H T, you can estimate H from the bond price. So like if you observe a bond price in the market, you can say I'm going to estimate H. So let's say I'm going to take some benchmark bonds, which I know the price of, and I'm going to estimate H for each of these bond prices, and I'm going to create a curve, which is going to be my hazard curve. And then I take another th derivative or bond that I don't know the price of, and I can use that same curve to price it. So essentially, what I'm, by doing this, what I'm saying is I'm going to replicate my derivative using these benchmark bonds as much as I can. That's the assumption that I'm making. And how, how about the ones, I mean, um, if um, multiple currencies are involved, if we are trying to trade with multiple different currencies, how does the, magic, the whole model differ? Well, if multiple currencies are involved, you can, first you can define, like, um, it becomes tricky. It's like, you can say each currency can devalue X amount. Like if default happens, you can have more than one currency being devalued. Uh, if you have more than one currency, if you have if you have more than two currencies, like three currencies, there's other identities you have to take care of. Like you, you really simulate, if you have three currencies, there is a triangle identity that, say, dollar euros times euro yen exchange rate has to equal to dollar yen exchange rate. That's kind of an arbitrage condition. Um, just like interest rates affects forward parity even stronger in some sense. And uh, so you, you just, you can basically, you can say multiple, you can write down multiple processes and price stuff. Um, how much do these equations change when you add in bonds that are paying coupons? And how do you factor in like duration and all that? Well, you know, you just, uh, you just uh, it's not hard really. You just, instead of having this, you just write down all the coupon payments when you pay them. And then you just take an expectation of all the coupon payments. So it's uh, really the same process. You just repeat it for every coupon. Why well, don't we shut the formal class over yeah. now, but st yeah. people have questions afterwards. We'll uh, yeah, I'm certainly around to answer Thank you questions. Very much. Anybody wants. Thank you.